And then there's the complexity tour. In the complexity tour, you're looking for things that will confuse the user or lead to user errors or involve interactions of so many things that the program becomes fragile. When I say fragile, I mean that it'll probably be broken by routine maintenance because so many things depend on each other. To decide what belongs in the tour, look for tasks that involve many parts or many pieces of data or long sequences of work or tasks that are split into pieces that are handled by several different programs or anything that's hard to describe or hard to explain. Complexity tours are a great example of a type of tour that only some testers find useful. For them, they get insights that lead to significant tests when they ask, what makes this program hard or confusing? But other testers don't find the complexity tours useful or not useful enough. For example, I think many inexperienced testers find them too hard to do, and so they don't get enough information from the amount of work that they put into it. Touring for complexity versus touring for the components of a program is like transaction tours versus feature tours. You probably won't do both, or not a lot of both. You'll probably focus more on one level of generality or the other, and someone else will focus differently. These differences are normal. Testers aren't robots. We're not interchangeable. We learn differently, we hunt differently, and we find different problems. You can be really good, I can be really good, and we can both be really different from each other. But we all need an overview. It's just that different tours will give different people different overviews that help them create interestingly different mental maps that help them as individuals imagine their approach to assessing the quality of the program. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you're okay, I'm okay, and everybody can do whatever they want. There's a lot of incompetent testing in the world. A lot of people who work as testers would really do a better service for the world if they switched to cooking donuts. But what I am saying is that competent testers explore in their own ways. Diversity is our field's strength. Uniformity is for donuts. Well, that's it for tours. From here, I want to take a more detailed look at function testing and then race through a first introduction to about 75 test techniques. In function testing, you test individual functions, one at a time. I create a function list to capture what I learn about a program when I do a feature tour. To create function lists, I use concept mapping tools. I think these are more efficient than spreadsheets and word processors. So here are some links to descriptions of concept mapping tools and links to some specific tools that I think work pretty well. Early in testing, I like to do sympathetic testing. The first coherent description I heard of sympathetic testing was from John Bach. He said that to be able to evaluate and criticize a product effectively, testers have to understand what's right with the product, why someone would use a product like this once it's finished with all parts working. Then when they understand that, they can explain bugs as things that take away from the value of the product. Function testing starts me down the path of sympathetic testing because it teaches me the range of things that the program can do. But it's just a start because most of the worthwhile tasks and benefits of the program involve using lots of features of the program together. I can't reach combinations with function tests, so I have to get to them later with transaction tours and benefit tours and scenario tests. But function tours help me understand the components of those more complex tours and tests. In general, I think it's wise to do function testing first before doing complex tests that involve several functions. And that's because early in testing, there are often a lot of bugs, including very simple bugs. I don't want to use a complex test to find a bug in an individual function. It's too hard to troubleshoot. Instead, I just want to test that function. Some testers prefer to start with interesting scenarios or other complex tests that involve many functions. Sometimes that's because of a belief that this is more efficient. I've been told over and over that if you cover 10 functions in every test, you can cover a thousand functions in a hundred tests, and that's way more efficient. I guess if all you count is how many tests, a hundred tests is a lot fewer than the thousand tests you'd have to run to test all thousand functions on their own. But I think this is a false economy. If you run a complex test, the first broken function stops the test. You can't keep running the test until that function gets fixed. All the later parts of that test are blocked. That's called a blocking bug. Sometimes people find serious bugs late in testing that should have been obvious sooner. Finding these bugs was delayed because the tests that would have reached them were blocked. Bugs in the first part of the test had to be fixed before the tester could run the rest of the test and get to the bug. I've heard testers blame the programming team for these bugs. I've heard them say that they wouldn't have found these bugs so late if the programmers had only fixed those other bugs sooner. I've even heard famous speakers at testing conferences encourage this kind of stuff. 
telling the testers to tell their management. The programmers should have fixed these bugs on time, and then these bugs wouldn't have been so hard to find. Well, I think that's baloney. We aren't the victims of the programmers. If we choose a fragile testing strategy, we're the victims of our own bad choices. If you don't want to be blocked by blocking bugs, design your test to achieve high coverage independently of the order that the programmers fix the bugs. That's in your control, not theirs. You can avoid this kind of unnecessary, self-inflicted helplessness just by doing early function testing with high function coverage. Testers also use function tests for smoke testing. The term smoke test comes from electronics. You start testing a new component by applying power. If it starts smoking, the component's bad. There's no point doing any further testing. You can apply the same idea to software. There are some things that the program just has to pass. If it fails any of those, something is fundamentally wrong, and there's just no point testing it further. So you give it back, you wait for the next build, and when the next build comes in, you apply the smoke tests again. Eventually, you get something that passes those tests and is worth testing in a more complete way. To be suitable for this role, smoke tests have to be simple, easily understood, and uncontroversial. In the smoke test suites that I've seen, most of the tests are function tests. After I finish basic one feature at a time testing, I run tests that combine many features. It's easy to lose track of which features have or have not been included in these more complex tests. So I often use a function list as a coverage checklist, especially when I build suites of scenario tests. When I create a new test, I note on the list which features are included in the test. Now this is a very simplistic coverage measure. It doesn't address how well the features are tested, it doesn't show what features have been tested with what other features, or with special data. But despite the limitations, I've often found it useful. Many groups rely on one or two test techniques for all of their test design. Surprisingly, many rely on function testing as a primary technique. For them, the function list is the core of their test plan. In fact, the person who taught me how to write a function list expected me to use it to organize all of my testing of his group's product. Now, I don't recommend using function testing as your primary technique, but it's useful to see how far you can stretch it, because sometimes the stretch version is useful. If you are going to rely heavily on function testing, one way to organize it is with a heavily detailed function list. This outline describes the types of notes that I've seen incorporated into those kinds of lists. In a detailed function list, along with listing the functions, it's useful to keep notes about the functions. What's this function for? How will you know if it's working? Are there any configurations that will block this function or make it work differently? Now, I've never seen a complete, fully detailed function list, but I have seen some pretty extensively detailed ones that have worked very well for the people who created them. You can do a lot with function testing, but this slide lays out some of the limitations of relying on function testing too heavily. Every technique has limitations. What makes them interestingly different is that they have different limitations. For example, if you're testing to check whether a program will meet the needs of its users, you're probably better served by scenario tests than function tests. On the other hand, if you're smoke testing, function tests are way better than scenarios. And that brings us to the broader presentation of techniques.